You know, uh, the greatest contrast is what gra grabs your attention. You know, uh, the physician comes for those that are sick, not for those that are well. And when you do see a change in someone's life, uh, that's drastic. That's where from night to day, uh, it's, it's really grabs your attention and gives you praise in your heart for it. And I do thank God for Kenny and for those that I, uh, I see like that, that, that God just does something so sovereign in their midst. It's just all God. Uh, it's not something that men have done or something that men could do. It's just what God does. And Kenny is one of the most faithful. In fact, he gets mad when we don't have services. He'll get mad at us. He'll accuse us of backsliding. And but we quit having church. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, this isn't the church. Is it? It's not the church that, uh, that God's dwelling in. It's not the body of Christ. Amen. This is a building. Amen. And thank God for the building. Amen. Thank God for uh, keeping the air conditioner contained in this room. Aren't you glad that we're not meeting out, on, out in the field somewhere in the hot sun? We'd have to still go there if God called us. Amen. But thank the Lord we've got an air-conditioned church. How many thank God for the air-conditioned church building? But this isn't the church. The church is us, the people, the body of Christ. You're the expression of him. God doesn't get expressed unless you express him. He's not going to express himself through a tree or a rock or a car. He's going to express himself through you and I. Amen? Amen. So uh, that's the reason why we quit having what people normally call church. Uh, every week coming together whether uh, God has something to say to them or not they're going to gather together religiously because it's what you do but uh, we're leaving and we're changing ourselves from the traditions of men that are dead amen what men do has no life in it it has a religiosity to it but it's time for us to live the uh, to leave the uh, types and shadows of Christ, those things that represent Him. My goodness, why would we settle for something that represents Him? You know what I mean? Why would I uh, settle for an ambassador when I can have access to the King? <laughs> And why would I settle for a tradition of forms and traditions and rituals when I can have holy communion with the living Christ? Hallelujah! And that's what I want. I want the living Christ. The one, the personal Jesus, the Christ. Did you know that Jesus is here? In this building, hallelujah, that we have gathered ourselves to, you brought him Amen. with you. Yes. So as the scripture says, we've quit having religious services and we are now gathering unto Christ Amen. by the call of the Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. In the early church, before men got a hold of it and started to organize it and started to put in their own ideas on it, the early church was full of life. So much life that people were being converted to it by the thousands. And it wasn't on TBN. <laughs> It wasn't being talked about. It was new. Jesus was a solitary man in a small area that ministered a gospel of good news. And at the end of his ministry and of his life, there was no one that believed upon him. 
they all thought the hope was lost because he was hanging on a wooden tree and he was dying. And everything he said and done was forgotten about because they looked at the Son of God, supposed to be the Son of God, and he was powerless seemingly over that. Now he could have called 10,000 angels to remove him from that cross. He could have annihilated all of his, those that beat him and spit upon him and bruised and cut him and reviled him. He could have caused fire to come down from heaven and consume them. And he didn't. Because he knew the plan. He knew the course. He knew it from the beginning in God. Before anything was made or done, he had already seen the end from the beginning. He knew that he was born to die. He was a sacrifice of God. Amen. And that he was the first begotten son of God. And the life that he took on himself as a man he had to bring that to an end so a greater life could begin. And that's why he said, I have received a commandment from my father that if I lay down my life, he will raise it back up again. The Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Now in the garden, he struggled. Because he was taking on the fashion and form of man. And in the garden, he had sought companionship, took three of the disciples apart with him, and then left them and said, Pray. And went back and sought his father and came back of course they had fallen asleep woke them up and said pray and when he had gone back into the garden and got before the Lord he said something that you would never guess that the son of God would say he said father if it be thy will cause this cup to pass from me now that's the reason why the scripture says that he is moved by our afflictions. Jesus is moved by our struggles of our humanity. Thank God that he's not just demigod up there that has no idea what man's going through. Amen? He is our elder brother. He is my brother. He's your brother. Yes, and he knows what we're going through. He knows our confusions at times. He knows our questioning. When we question God about what he's doing in our lives, and I don't know, think there's anybody here that hasn't at one time or another said, what is going on, Lord? You know, Kathy Beckham sent out a wonderful, uh, uh, she sends out these emails with wonderful uh, uh, writings, short, concise writings that she sends out. And uh, I read her latest one in my email box this morning. And uh, she, she talks about the fact, have you ever had a word given to you by God, a wonderful word, and then all hell breaks loose? <laughs> and God promises you this and God says this is going to happen and, the, and the, before you ever hardly even get home it seems like things get worse instead of better and that's the and she brings out in this uh, wonderful writing about how um, the purpose of that and it's somewhat what we're talking about this morning is that everything 
has to be tested in God. The scripture says, take care what you build on this that I built. Take care what you put on my foundation. Don't put wood and don't put stubble and perishable things because everything's going to get tried. <laughs> and only the gold and the silver and the precious metals are going to stay. Everything else is going to go. And that's just the plan. That's how God is bringing the world through death. I said through death. Not into death. Through death into life. Amen. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Amen. The world wasn't lost and without hope when Jesus was on the cross suffering. The world was being saved. Amen. Yes. The world was getting ready to be redeemed. <laughs> the world was getting ready for there to begin something and something else to end or be fulfilled. Everything up to Jesus that God was doing in man at that point was external. External cleansings. Wash your hands before you eat. Wear the right clothes. Look the part. Uh, don't do this. You can think about it, but don't do it. Well, Jesus shot that to pieces, didn't he? You remember when Jesus said, he says, now you've heard it said that if you commit adultery, that you've sinned. But I'm going to tell you that if you even lust in your heart, You've sinned. And you see the law up until Jesus, everything was external. Somebody said it this morning. Karen did. I believe. If you want to get external things changed, change what's inside you, the spirit. That's where the real work of God is at. You look at everybody and say, oh, they look like a mess. All oh, their lives are a mess. All oh, this, they're, you know, they're full of sin. And look at them, they're, 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 um, uh, you can just tell by looking at them, being in the presence, they talk like a mess. They act like a mess. There's no hope for them. Well, well what do you mean there's no hope? Hallelujah. That's just external stuff. Once God appears in the midst of them, hallelujah, he starts working on the inside. Yeah. Glory to God. Now you can try to tie, tie up the wolf if you want. That's what the church systems of religion do. They preach thou shalt not. Or you're going to go to eternal damnation. That's the only way they have of changing anybody's behavior is to threaten them. Are you hearing me? Don't do that or else. And you know how long that lasts? <laughs> Not very long at all. And you can go by the experience of your own children if you want to have a real good example. The thou shalt nots don't work when you're talking about being transformed into the image and the likeness of our Father. Hallelujah. And it's not about missing hell and going to heaven. That's not it at all. Hallelujah. That's not why we're here, is it? It's just to appease God so he doesn't send us to eternal damnation. Come on. There's got to be sonship in this. There's got to be relationship of a father to his children. Hallelujah. He's not an unknown God. He's not up there somewhere and we have no idea what he's doing. He's given us the blueprint. Hallelujah. But it's not at all like what we have been preached to about it. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that. They, they're carnal in their thinking when it comes to God and his relationship with creation. 
You know, it's easy for uh, a an American that's uh, raised in a Christian family that have all friends that are Christians that are uh, that that it's not just a choice, but it's a family tradition. These Church of Christ folks down the road here in 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 downtown Dixon, at Walnut Street and uh, Center, I guarantee you some of them are the third or fourth generation Church of Christ. I mean, they have no choice. If they left the Church of Christ, they're leaving their family. You see what I'm talking about with religion? And how people do things and say things not because they really believe it, but because it's the way that you have to go. I don't know when God changed. I, I guess I do know. It was a, it was a like a Paul experience with me. Not everybody goes through that. But there came a time when I knew that I could reject the teachings of men. Because I looked into it myself with an open heaven to God. And I read the scriptures for myself and I got into the Greek meaning of this translation of King James that was written 1500 and some years after Jesus was on earth. And I preach out of it. I haven't got anything against it. It's just that I dig into it. <laughs> and I don't take what King James interpreters went by because I have Strong's Concordance. We all do. Isn't this a wonderful age we live in? I have, a, I have a Bible program called PC Study Bible and it has all the commentaries and it has all the Greek uh, scholars telling me what the actual meaning of those words were. And I'll tell you, King James, when it says the end of the world, the end of the world, it uses the word world and the Greek word for that is eon, which has nothing to do with the world. It has to do with time. And it means an age, a dispensation of time, a section of time. So when the King James says, tell us, Lord, what will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? It's actually saying, what is going to be the sign of you revealing yourself? Because he's already here. I know the church sings songs uh, that he's up there somewhere. But at the same service, they'll sing, he's down in my heart. <laughs> and this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, how can you let it shine if it's up there? It's schizophrenia. That's how man deals with God. He doesn't know what God's doing. You know who doesn't know what God's doing? The servant. Who's trying to earn his way into the graces of God. Who's trying to do the religious thing so that he doesn't go to hell. And it has nothing to do with loving and adoring and worshiping and praising God. Hallelujah. Oh, they do that, but only so that they don't go to hell. There is a living relationship, folks, that we're coming into. Hallelujah. That was in the early church, and this is going to be even greater than that. Hallelujah. Because this is the former and the latter reign all together. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him this morning. We know him. Glory. We know our Lord. Hallelujah. We're not following after him. Like a servant does. The scripture is plain when it says a servant knoweth not 
what his master doeth. And we're still in a servant attitude. Many of us are. Because we don't understand the judgments of God. We don't understand why God's picking on us so much. We don't understand why God doesn't just give us a lily uh, a bed so we can go tiptoeing through the lilies. And through the tulips. And through the rose bushes. No, not the rose bushes. They got thorns on them. But that's all we want is, is heaven. And you don't get to heaven unless you go through hell. And that's just the plain truth. This is mountaintop that I'm talking about. Mount Zion is situated in the tops of the whole mountain range. And it's the highest peak. It's, it's situated in the high places of God. And you don't get there unless you're willing to climb. It's not valley. And leave it to man and he'll settle for valley every time. He'll take the easy road. You know why uh, Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit, right? Because when they went in with the other spies to spy out the land, the other spies came back and said, we can't do it. We can't take it. They got giants. They've got walled cities. It's formidable. It's impossible. It's too much trouble. And Joshua and Caleb came back and said, hey, they're all waiting for us, man. It's laid open for us. It's clear path. Yeah. <laughs> they said, their, 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 uh, their walls are all tore down. They weren't tore down. But they saw them as nothing. And they didn't pay any attention to those giants, so-called giants. They were made small in their eyes because Caleb said, Lord, I have been uh, 80 some years waiting for my promise. Hallelujah. And I want that mountain that you promised me. Hallelujah. All these years, my eyes are still young and I can still see with my eyes and the strength in my limbs have not waned. Hallelujah. And now, therefore, give me my mountain. Hallelujah. Well, I'm telling you, there is a place that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And that's where we're going, is into that place in Him. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come hell or high water, come fire, come testing, come trial, we are going into the throne room of God. Why? Because out of that throne room is going to come a word that's going to set the nations free. Yes. It's going to topple kingdoms of men and it's going to establish and make the kingdoms of this world the kingdoms of our Lord. Hallelujah. It is going to pull down every stronghold. It's going to pull down cancer. It's going to pull down a, a depression. It's going to pull down Alzheimer's. It's going to pull down addictions. It's going to pull down every disease known to man out of the word of that throne room, out of a people who have gone through the hell, gone through the fire, climbed the mountain of God. There's a word in them that's going to be released. Hallelujah. And they're going to give their life for it. Amen. These are those who, have, who are called with the same calling that Jesus was called with. Now think about that. Even as my father has brought me into this world, so has he brought you into this world. With the same purpose. You were born... To die. Yes. yes, you were. But that doesn't mean that you're going to have to die 
in a grave. There is another death. The grave isn't even death. That's not even what, what the scripture means by death. The grave is just a point of transfer. Of the laying down of a biological house. That 2 Corinthians the 5th chapter says, if that house were to be dissolved, you have another house inside that house. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't die in that, in that death. That's your body. That's the only thing that dies when you lay your body down is your body. Hallelujah. But you don't die. Hallelujah. You live because he lived. You live. Hallelujah. Now, there's going to be a people, according to the scripture, that are not going to die, but they're going to be changed. Changed. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel, according to the scriptures. That God has a plan to bring creation out of darkness, out of corruption, out of mortality, into incorruption and immortality. Hallelujah. And I said the last time that we taught on this, Heaven and hell, if you want to keep thinking of that as a location somewhere, you can. But I'm telling you, that's not the actual truth of the matter. Hell and heaven are states of being. I'm in heaven right now, in Christ. I'm in heavenly places. In Jesus Christ. I've also been in hell. I'll give you a word what hell means in the King James. And how many know that the English words that we use every day, that they came from England, right? <laughs> it's the uh, King's English. And in the... Uh, 1500s and so when the scriptures was written they had different usages of English words that have changed over the centuries changed their meanings and that's common uh, that's, a, that's just a common fact with the linguistics is the fact that English the word remained but the meaning for it changed and hell is one of those words I'll tell you, in England, when King James uh, had this uh, translation, the word hell was used like for, in your garden for potatoes. You would say to your wife or somebody, I'm going to go out in the garden, I'm going to hell some potatoes. I'm going to go out and I'm going to hell us some potatoes. And what that was actually meaning was to dig up some, to bring them out, to unearth it and bring it up. It was called helling. Now, we've talked about the many words for hell in the scriptures. That There's more than just one Greek word as there was for eon. With King James saying world, uh, it actually meant what was going to be the sign of your coming and the end of this age that we're in. So for us to take that and everything that follows there in Matthew 24 is where that's found out, found at. And for us to translate that and say, okay, that's what's going to happen at the end of the world is actually not what was stated there. But you'd have to dig into the Greek to find that out. Same way with hell. Hell is a singular English word that's used for three different Greek words. One was a literal description, Gehenna, 
is in the Greek and it meant in the valley of the son of Hinnom it was actually a name of a dumping place outside of Jerusalem that was involved for in the t in in uh, years back from when Jesus came to earth it was involved this place was involved with uh, sacrifices and even was involved in the burning up of children <coughs> sacrificing them to other gods and uh, it by the time that Jesus was born it had become the city dump where all the dead carcasses of animals and people were put in there and it was a fire that was lit like they do in a lot of uh, uh, refuse places that was that would was kept burning so that it would burn up all the corruption that was in that place and that's good and that's all that fire does <laughs> fire burns up anything that's it, that's combustible until only that which can remain will remain all right now we're being changed from corruptible into incorruption that's going to be in first corinthians the 15th chapter 51st verse very well known kingdom uh, message uh, verses behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep now that word sleep there of course is the same way that jesus said about lazarus when they told him lazarus was dead and jesus said no he's only sleeping they said, no, Lord, he's not sleeping. He is dead. And they kept it up on him. He tried to tell them, no, he's not really dead. No, de Lord, he's in the grave. He's in the tomb. They buried him. He's dead. And finally, Jesus says, I'm going to go and wake him up. Which he did. So the word here means we shall not all lay our earthly bodies down behold I show you a mystery we shall not all lay these earthly bodies down but we shall all be changed including those that have laid their bodies down is that right it said that didn't it behold we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed I thank God that my father my mother that all of my friends that I used to have that never knew the Lord in this life, I thank God that I have a promise from God that at death it does not leave them hopeless. Hallelujah. But all shall be changed. Why do I believe that? Why do I know that? Because that's all that fire does is change. Hallelujah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory well there is none because that's not hallelujah what's going to uh, what the final enemy that Jesus is putting under our feet is it's not the grave it's death itself is the death that works in us even now yes. hallelujah but is being overcome by the victory that G that charlotte sang about this morning i didn't come here to talk about some far off place called heaven i've come here to be awakened yeah yeah to waken up to God hallelujah to leave the religious dead 
practices and to come into a living and life-giving, hallelujah, presence of the Lord, hallelujah, that is swallowing up all death, hallelujah, yet in me and you, new, hallelujah, that is our only hope, is to come into the presence of the corporate Christ, hallelujah. Of that presence that you brought with you and that I brought with me that goes home with us, hallelujah, doesn't stay in this building somewhere. It lives in us. Woo! Hallelujah. It is alive and it is well. And he is not out there beyond a, a Hubble telescope somewhere waiting for some time when he can come back to earth. He's here. Hallelujah. He's here. Just because we hasn't been seen, just because we haven't got the eyes to see him with, just because we're still carnal and we're still earthly, that we cannot receive him yet, does not mean that he's not here. Hallelujah. I tell you, I have the witness, hallelujah, of the scripture. He is here. Lord, he's in flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we need our eyes opened. We need our hearts opened. We need to see him as he is. And not as we imagine him to be. Hallelujah. I tell you when we do. We will set the world afire. And I don't mean we're going to be a bunch of. uh, What do they call those uh, people that set fires. Arsonists. We're not going to be a bunch of arsonists. But spiritually, we will. <laughs> you are a, a, about a six foot flame of fire, and anything that touches you is going to get set on fire. Amen. Absolutely. Turn with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Another fantastic chapter in the scriptures. And let's go to the 11th chapter just above it. And these all in the 1139. And this is the faith chapter as everybody has come to know it. Talks about all of those that has by faith done exploits and had God miraculously move in their lives. It uplifts you every time you read it. We can all identify with the 11th chapter. Amen. Although we haven't a one of us been eaten by a lion yet. But when I read about it, I understand what that means for me. Amen? I have lions in my life. I surely do. That are trying to devour me. Devour my faith. Devour my uh, uh, love. Devour my patience. And God delivered them and he's delivering us. You can read it all. Famine, pestilence, all that that they came through. Hallelujah. And we don't have to go through those literally. We look at that and say, Amen, Lord. You're going to bring me through my famine for your presence. Hallelujah. Even though you have uh, hidden yourself from me for a little while. Hallelujah. I will see you and live. Hallelujah. Amen. Gloria Morris wrote that beautiful song. I would have despaired had I not believed that I'd see the goodness. I'd see the goodness of my Lord. Amen. That is what we are going through every day. But that's in the scriptures. And we take that 11th chapter and we apply that to our lives. Everybody does. But boy, when you start looking at things like heaven and hell in the same way. And understand that Jesus was talking about something way beyond what the church has settled for. That hell is actually the rehabilitation. Of humanity. It's not like our incarcerations of our prisons. You know what we're doing. We're just imprisoning people. And making them worse. They're learning new and improved ways. To become worse criminals. 
There's no rehabilitation to our prisons now. It's just a place to take them and get them out of society until some judge says we can't afford them anymore, so we're going to let them out on the streets again. And we let them out by sending them to a school for criminals. And they learn how to break in better. They learn how to get past the law better. And that's our prison system. But God's way is much better than our way. Amen? And hell, the state and condition of hell is rehabilitative. It stops you and it makes you take inventory. Hallelujah. And it burns up. What is making us do the things we're doing? That's what I'm looking for is not just a change of mind. It's a change of nature. Yes. Like I said, you can tie up the wolf and the wolf will just be waiting until he gets loose from that chain. Mm -hmm. And he'll still be the wolf. And that's what people think God's doing. They're taking the sinners and he's chaining them up in hell because there's nothing he can do with them. <laughs> they're just too much for them. And literally that is how they're preaching the judgments of God. But the Bible tells me that the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. Hallelujah. It tells me this also. That the lion and the bullock will be at peace with one another. And that the lion is going to eat grass. Just like the bullock. And I tell you there's no mention of a big old chain around their neck. They have been changed. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank God that I'm not going to be struggling forever with a fleshly mind. Through eternity, having to ask God not to look at it. Or worried about some revolt somewhere in heaven because we weren't totally changed somehow. I thank God that my human nature is laying down with the God nature and it is eating of the same things as the God nature is hallelujah oh, hallelujah I'm, I'm not talking about somebody that learns church doctrine and then changes their outward expression of life but goes home and beats their wife behind closed doors or molests their children or all the other things that happens in the church realm today. All, uh, uh, and then when it comes to light, everybody in the church says, Oh, my goodness. Who would have thought that the worship leader would run off with the piano player <laughs> and throw their soul to hell? Don't you think there's a better way than just learning church doctrine? Letting the dealings of God in our lives change us. You wonder why your life is such a mess right now? Because you're being redeemed. Because you have to let go of where you've been. Hallelujah. The only way that God's going to get you to move is the way he moved the prophet. Hallelujah. By drying up the river and causing the ravens to stop flying to your feet. Hallelujah. And if he has to do that, he will. Hallelujah. He'll make you the most miserable person on earth. But that's a good sign. Because whether you're glad or whether you're mad, hallelujah, both work in the plan of God. Yes. It's when you're indifferent that you're in danger of hellfire. I'd rather you be hot or cold towards me rather than lukewarm. Amen. When you're indifferent, 
when you're just coasting along, when you're just a part of a herd, and all you're doing is keep me in your hip pocket on Sunday mornings, then I can't do anything in your life. But I'm going to get your attention. Hallelujah. And I'm going to bring you where I am. Hallelujah. And if it takes dragging you, I will drag you. Hallelujah. If it takes setting a fire of about three feet behind you, I'm going to do that too. Hallelujah. I'm going to burn up everything around you until you say amen. Because too much is at stake for this people. You should be the happiest people on the world, on the earth, but you're not. And that's wrong. We should be dancing all over this building right now. Because the king is here. Yes. The message of the kingdom has become, for most of the people in the message uh, of kingdom, it is becoming the same thing as the message of of the doctrines of the church now. We preach it real good. We talk about it. We sing about it just like they do. But we're not even participating in the glory of it. How many is ready for that to change? Yes. Yes. Are you ready to sing a new song? Yes. Yes. Are you ready to praise God not with your lips and tongue only, but with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind, everything within you singing praise unto God for His mercies endure forever and ever. Are you ready to throw away everything that's causing you trouble? Are you ready to lay down your ministry? Are you ready to lay down your former relationships? Are you ready to know God anew? Hallelujah. In a way that you've never known Him before. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I believe we're there. Hallelujah. And it can't happen here. It's got to happen when you leave the building. It's got to happen at your house. It's got to happen when you lay down in your bed. It's got to happen when you go to work. It's got to happen from this point on. Hallelujah. You have to know He has come and He has filled you with the joy and the peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That He is revealing Himself to us now. Yes. Hebrews 11, 39 says, And these all, these witnesses, having obtained a good report, having had witness born to them through faith, received not the promise. Wow. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete. Remember now, in the Greek, perfection does not mean sinless. It means complete. All your parts together. Complete. Hallelujah. Be ye perfect, even as I am perfect, says the Lord. Be you complete in me, even as I am complete in you. Hallelujah. I in you, you in me, we in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Everything in oneness. Everything together at the same mind. The same purpose. The same calling. Hallelujah. If you can't see yourself as one of those of the first fruit company of Jesus. If you think that you're just another servant following after him. I pray that God will waken you up. Hallelujah. That your eyes will be open. That you'll quit being just a preacher of God and that you'll start being the mirror the glass that shows forth his likeness can you say amen come on preach with me a little bit here 
preach with me. Don't make me preach at you. Preach with me. Hallelujah. Let's minister Christ. Hallelujah. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What did it say? Did it say that we're waiting to go to those witnesses? Is that what it said? Or did it say that you, you, now are compassed about in another dimension that your natural eyes don't have the ability to see it, but that your inner man, your spiritual man, he lives there. He is there. And he rejoices in it. Hallelujah. Compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, this says perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Can you despise, hallelujah, all the shame goes along with you being different? I'm different, man. I'm an alien. <laughs> I preached a message about aliens. And I'm not talking about Martians or those little green men or those alien creatures that you see on TV. I'm talking about I am alien to this world system of corruption. And so are you. I come from God. Amen. <gasps> I am not of this world. Can you say that? Amen. Why can we say that? It's recorded. Yes. That's what Jesus said. Amen. You're in the world, but you're not of it. Amen. <laughs> this world can be set on fire of hell. You're not of it. Hallelujah. You're not to behave like it. You're not to take on His image or His likeness. And you're not to be conformed to it. You're to be transformed out of the image of the earthly into the image of the heavenly. Hallelujah. Oh, if you don't truth we're under the judgment of God and I'm rejoicing in it I'm not mad at it I'm not worried about it I'm not hiding from it I want God to judge me if you knew what that word really means you would too we've, we've been judged by men for so long that we think that's how God's judging us Men will judge you for the tattoos on your body. Men will judge you for the length of your hair. Men will judge you because of your uh, wild children. Men will judge you because of, the, of, of, of this and because of that. But God, when the scripture talks about God judging, it's talking about God separating from you the corruption from the incorruption. God is talking about God taking the combustible things and burning them up with His presence and His substance. Woo! Hallelujah. I, that, what that means is that God is saying, I see you. I see you. I see you. It's unto victory. It's a sentence. He is the supreme judge, you see. And his judgment brings you to a sentence. Now according to the church, that's eternal damnation. But under, according to the scripture, it's unto life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because in the end, when everything's done, when everything is completed, when all that God is going to do, he does, 
in the very end, God will be the all in all of you. Shandala Mahaya. In all of them. In all of this. <laughs> everything will be to the praise and the glory of the mighty God. Amen. That created it all. But listen here now. 22nd verse. But you are come unto Mount Zion. Are come unto Mount Zion. I hear you inner man. I have a great battle between me and my inner man. Between my carnal mind, which is my greatest enemy. Forget about the devil, brother. It's you. <laughs> it's not some devil out here that's your biggest problem. It's you. It's this. Data in and data out. Reasoning, logical thinking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is up, that's down. <laughs> this is left, that's right. That's what I know here. But in my spirit, whoo, hallelujah, I know other things. Glory to God. My spirit quickens itself every once in a while and, it, and I feel it, hallelujah, an excitement in me that I don't even know what I'm excited about. Yes. I felt an excitement before this service. I had no reason here to be excited about it. I had to get up early. <laughs> I had to get myself all ready, prettied up. So I wouldn't shock you. <laughs> if you saw Shard and I the way we go around our house, you, you, you wouldn't uh, even come to hear us minister anymore, I don't think. You'd say, oh my Lord, God's man and woman of the hour with the power. <laughs> we used to do a radio broadcast from uh, Phoenix. The radio station was in Detroit, so we had to mail our uh, tapes in there. And Shard and I had such a busy household full of ministry and everything else that we had, we'd had to get into a closet just to, to where you wouldn't hear everything going on. And, and I, I had the microphone hanging over the closet rod. And we're in there with the boxes and the clothes and the shoes. <laughs> and the people think we're in a church somewhere <laughs> preaching to them. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and we, we looked at each other once in a while and say, if they only knew. <laughs> if they, thank God this isn't TV. <laughs> preaching out of a closet with the microphone hanging over the clothes rod. And me trying to get in the microphone and then giving away for her to get in the microphone. <laughs> Welcome to the house of the Lord presents. <laughs> oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory. But you don't have to pretty yourself up for us old chickens here, hallelujah. We know what, what happens when you get home, praise God. And I can't wait to get out of these clothes when I get home and get into my shorts. <laughs> you come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. Oh, come on now. Jerusalem's up there somewhere. It's waiting to come back and set itself down in uh, Israel. <laughs> and split the Mount of Olives. No, you've come unto that right here. You haven't gone anywhere. It's right here. The heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels. I've seen them. God has opened up my eyes. Give me a glimpse every once in a while of them. Charlotte and I used to have a house in, in Detroit where uh, we had the sovereign time of getting lost in God. We couldn't preach what we're preaching now if we hadn't had those experiences. Supernatural experiences. Beyond this world. Alien to this world. Supernatural visitations of the Lord. And now uh, we can minister these things knowing that what we see isn't all that we get. There are things around us and in us and moving for us. Hallelujah. If God be for us, what can be against us? Because there's more for us than there is against us. Hallelujah. When the prophet told the God, Lord, open up the eyes of this poor servant. With the army gathered against them and getting ready to come down and kill them. He said, open up the eyes of this servant. And when he opened up his eyes, what was there all along was that army of men surrounded 
by the army of God. Now that wasn't a one time thing. All your enemies are surrounded by God. Nothing's out of control in Him. Can you hear me on that? He has His way. And if that way is hard, if that way causes us suffering, if that way causes us to have to give up something, let go of it. That's the hardest thing for us to do, folks. That's why it's going to take the judgment of God on us. Because we're so in love with this corruptible state that it's hard for us to let go so that we can grab hold of the greater. Hallelujah. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's the way it is with humans. They want what you can see, what you can touch, smell, uh, hear, all of that. But this world I'm talking about, the world that we're all going to be brought into one way or the other, either through laying down our body or through being changed while we're on our feet, we're all going to get into that world. Jackie's there right now. Brother Ryan's there right now. Everybody we've ever known or haven't known that have laid their bodies down, they are where I'm preaching at right now. Ernest is in that realm. And I'm telling you, these are not over there. They're right here. You have come unto that place. But you're not aware of it. You haven't had your eyes open to it. We're not living there yet. We're in the middle between the two realms. Little glimpses, but mostly in this realm. Doesn't that have to be changed? Where we live more in that realm than we do this realm? Don't you think we have to be changed in that? Don't you think that's what these appearings are about right now? These visitations? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want a visitation from God this morning with you. Hallelujah. Let me finish this and I'll quit. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect or complete, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. That's what we've all come to in the 26th verse. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken. As of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Amen. There's temporal things and there's eternal things. Paul said, looking, we look no longer at those things which are seen. But we look into those things that are unseen. Amen. That's what I'm preaching this morning. How many want God to open up your eyes to those things that are unseen? Father, I pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, open every eye in this place, O oh Lord. By your sweet spirit, Lord, may you take the scales off of these eyes, O oh God, that we might see clearly now. Hallelujah. No longer through a glass darkly. No longer through the murkiness of our carnal mind. Oh, quicken us, Lord, with the quickening of your spirit and release us from our bad vision, Lord, from the temporalness of our vision, Lord. Let us look into eternity things. Hallelujah. Oh, sharababababadadabakaya. Open up your heaven to us, Lord. Open up the realm of the Spirit to us, Lord. Let us not be satisfied with this place that we have been in, Lord. Oh, God, bring us out and bring us in. Hallelujah. To a greater place in you, Father. In Jesus' name, every day. Every single day, Lord, cause our vision to be greater. Yes. 
and greater and greater. Don't leave us alone. Hallelujah. Don't give Jerusalem any rest until she is made a praise in all of the earth, Lord. I thank you for the place you're bringing us to. Lord, let us no longer be dragged by you. Let us start to walk in you as a son of God. Hallelujah. And everybody said amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.